Welcome back, WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. We are positively about to get back out on the Crab Cake Trail from Ocean City, Maryland, off the Deep Creek Lake and places I've never been, doing things I've never done, including some glamping. We're going to be eating some crab cakes at State Fair is where we're going to be coming out of our shell on the 21st. But before we get out there for an outdoor endeavor with former Baltimore County Executive Don Muller, we're going to be down at Fadley's kicking the tour off with the queen herself, Nancy uh, Damey. They're all going to be joining us for crab cakes along with John Sarbanes. Uh, we're also going to be over at Costas uh, kicking off the crab cake tour and getting this thing going with shipping with our Great, great sponsors. Uh, selling the condo? Uh, well, then you need Jeff Muller at Muller & Gary Realty. Make sure you're doing that. Uh, we're selling my condo. Here's the view. Don't want to sell it too much, but Jeff Muller will have that out at Muller & Gary Realty. Don Muller now joins us for another Baltimore Positive uh, Endeavor. Uh, this is going to be a great segment because you and I have been arguing about John Means and Orioles and stuff, and now we're going to ramp back down into the important issues of uh, this state and some policy and uh, one of your favorite topics and and one of your, your, your favorite background resources, education. Education is going to be at the forefront, and this is where I get to learn some social studies, Don Moeller. Well, N Nestor, we are delighted to have uh, one of the candidates, one of the announced candidates for governor of the state of Maryland, and an incredible, incredible background. I say, Nestor, we, 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 rare, we are almost always the uh, least educated people uh, on the segment. Today, we've got Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. Uh, Mr. Secretary John King, you couldn't fit Princeton in. You didn't want to, you didn't want to go. You didn't want to hit them all. Harvard, Harvard, Yale, Columbia. You, you, you sort of made the tour, huh? I do love school. So I, 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 I enjoy studies. So that, that worked out. Well, Don was my high school guidance counselor, which is how this whole thing happened in 1982. So we always love having education people on and education leaders because I reached him three years ago. I said, I think we need a social studies course. I think we need to learn more. Mm, mm. Well, well, we're going to learn a, a little bit today. Again, former secretary of education, the president and CEO of the Education Trust. You've launched an advocacy group that's really far reaching called Strong Future Maryland. Let, let's start. Well, let's just start at the beginning, as they say. My, my good buddy, and it's hard for me to believe it will be two years, actually three years since he's gone. It, that just doesn't even compute. But on May the 10th, we will be looking back at three years since county executive cabinets passed away. But whenever, uh, Mr. Secretary, we would meet with candidates for office, people would come and they'd want to pick his brain. They'd want his counsel about what they were about to do, whether it was run for county council, run for delegate, run for United States, you name it. They would come and they would ask advice. And he would literally say to them, tell me on a napkin why you want to run. And it is almost that old Roger Mudd question, right? When he looks at Ted Kennedy and he goes, why do you want to be president? And everybody still sees poor Ted Kennedy like a deer in headlights. So I turned to uh, John King, and I say, why in the world do you want to be governor of Maryland? What do you say to the folks out there? Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. It, you know, it really starts with my own experience as a kid. Um, when I grew up, both my parents passed away. My mom when I was eight, my dad when I was 12. And the thing that saved me was public schools, a high-functioning public institution that made all the difference. Um when, when it was just my dad and me after my mom passed, he was struggling with undiagnosed Alzheimer's. So home was this place that was scary and inconsistent and unstable, but teachers, fantastic public school teachers made school this place where I could be a kid when I couldn't be a kid at home. And later when I was a teenager, I got in a lot of trouble, as often happens with kids who've experienced trauma at early ages. I actually got kicked out of high school. I'm the first U.S. Secretary of Education had been kicked out of high school. What'd um, you do? Uh, a no, lot of things I shouldn't. Go to the principal. I mean, uh, was the principal. A lot of things I shouldn't have. I was angry, you know, as a lot of kids are who, who, who've gone through trauma. And Did you I really struggled. To get kicked out? Yeah, yeah. I okay. really struggle with adult authority. And I was, I was lucky that there were then teachers and a counselor who gave me a second chance. 
And so again, it was a public institution, public schools that's, that saved my life a second time. And so when I think about what a governor can do, to me, it's really about making sure that government is a force for good in people's lives, making sure that our education system is as strong as possible to give kids a real shot in life, making sure our economy is as strong as possible, creating good um, jobs for folks and creating a path to opportunity for folks maybe who haven't in the past been able to get a foothold in the economy. And it's making sure our environment is healthy and sustainable. And, and that work of making government a force for good in people's lives, that's, that's what my whole career has been about. And that's what I want to do as governor. Well, that, you know, that's when, when you look at that and you decide that the future forward <clears throat> is public service in that arena, uh, th that's, that's not an easy decision, right? For you and your family, uh, one, you know, as we were getting ready to come on the air this morning, one of the potential gubernatorial candidates, Baltimore County Executive John Oshevsky Jr., announced that he's going to stay uh, and run for re-election as, as Baltimore County Executive. He's, he's received high marks there and, and, and would have been, you know, a formidable adversary. And, and, and again, one of the things that I'm struck by, uh, Mr. Secretary, is really the high quality of folks in this field. I mean, it, both on the Democratic and Republican side. I mean, Republicans have, at this point, Kelly Schultz. They may have Michael Steele. Uh, you know, you're, you're stepping into a field that if you believe, we know Peter Francho is in. Uh, you know, it looks like Wes Moore is going to be in. People talk about possibly Angela also Brooks and, and others. We hear about Doug Ganser. We've got former county executive Rashern Baker. What's going to set you apart? And how do you go about Tell folks, Nestor loves the so studies part. How do you go about running for governor? How do you put together a campaign? Yeah. Yeah, look, you know, I think you have to build an infrastructure that that uh, engages people in every part of the state. And, oh, you know, in the last year, I built a progressive advocacy organization, Strong Future Maryland. We worked on a range of issues, education, social safety net, things like protecting folks from eviction, improving worker protections. Uh, we worked on an economic development agenda, including uh, a black economic agenda with, with Speaker Jones. Uh, we worked on environmental issues, environmental justice, climate action, and we worked with folks in every part of the state. And so I've been doing that work of, of building those statewide networks and relationships. And I think we need a governor who's a governor for every part of the state. Um, you know, I live in, in Silver Spring in Montgomery County. My kids go to Montgomery County Public Schools. Um, I love our experience with the Montgomery County Schools because our kids are getting a racially, socioeconomically diverse school experience. Um, but I also know there are parts of the state where we really have a lot of work to do to improve educational opportunity. There are parts of the state where there hasn't been the, the kind of economic opportunity there should be. Uh, certainly on the Eastern Shore, out in Western Maryland, there's work that we have to do to make sure that state government is serving every part of the state. And I think a campaign should be about that, listening to folks, hearing what they're concerned about, and making sure government is responsive. Well, we are with former uh, Secretary of Education in the Obama administration, uh, John King, President and CEO of the Education Trust and head of the advocacy group Strong Future Maryland. John, when you talk about your vision for the state, N Nestor and I just finished a roundtable in one of our regular segments with some of our pundits and experts. And the question that always comes up, and I'm sure you've looked at this, is where's the disconnect in the fact that on almost every issue, voters, the public writ large, support democratic positions on the issues, whether it's gun safety or health care or support for uh, infrastructure, support for education. You go right down the list. There's not an issue that voters overwhelmingly don't support the democratic positions on those issues, but it doesn't necessarily translate to the ballot box. You know, uh, Maryland has had you know, Larry Hogan for two terms, Bob Ehrlich. I mean, uh, Martin O'Malley is really the only Democrat that's been able to break through that 
that wall, so to speak. Uh, nationally, there's a good chance Democrats will lose uh, the House again in 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 20, uh, 24. What what or 2022? What, what's the disconnect between these positions that you believe in and advocate for and having voters understand how those issues should translate. Walk us through that as you see it. Sure, sure. Well, look, I think voters have to have trust in the ability of the person they're voting for to actually deliver on the promises they're making. They have to have trust in their management skills and their understanding of how government works. And look, you know, we're going to have in, in, in this race, as, as is, is true in many political races around the country, our fair share of millionaires and celebrities. But at the end of the day, what people want is someone who can get the job done through government. That's, that's what I've done in my career. Uh, you've got to make sure that people have confidence that when you say we're going to really leverage our assets as a state, you know, we've got NIH, the University of Maryland system, Johns Hopkins, uh, NSA, we ought to have a thriving innovation economy. But instead, if you look at the numbers, we're getting pretty thoroughly outcompeted by Virginia. And we're not making the kinds of choices we should to, to ensure a innovation economy. You know, on the day that Amazon announced they were opening in Northern Virginia, the same day, Virginia Tech announced they were opening a satellite campus to support Amazon and any other tech businesses that move to the region. You know, they have hustle. And we haven't always in Maryland had that same level of hustle around getting businesses to move here and to start here. I want you to I want you to continue and then I'm going to come back, <laughs> you know, you, you, you threw out there the millionaires and celebrities piece. I, I made a note. I'll, I'll come back to that. But before we do, I think one of the things we've become aware of our listeners is they, cause they follow up with us, right? They, they'll send us comments or questions on social media. So you said we, we're losing to Virginia. We're losing a step. The day they opened, Virginia Tech made another answer. So I can hear people saying, all right. Mr. Secretary, I hear you say we're losing. Tell me how a governor turns that around. Rather than just necessarily platitudes, give me some specifics that a governor king would look for to turn that train around. Yeah. So so three things come immediately to mind. One, uh, Larry Hogan made a huge mistake in canceling the Red Line project. There's just no question that transportation is an essential part of economic development. Building the red line would have connected high poverty neighborhoods to where the jobs are, would have created the opportunity for mixed use uh, development around each of the stops. That was a mistake. We ought to revisit that. We now have President Biden leading on infrastructure. Hopefully we have an opportunity for next governor to move forward on a project like the red line project. Two, uh, we ought to have better tax incentives for folks to launch new businesses based on research that is happening in the state. Uh, For example, Howard University owns property in Prince George's County. They're interested in the potential of creating a research center where there would be federally funded research happening with Howard faculty members, but then Uh, there'd be the opportunity to grow businesses from that research. We've got a similar effort in Montgomery County. We could build build on the work that Johns Hopkins has been doing to try to create um, an innovation economy in Baltimore City. Uh, We ought to double down on, on those kinds of efforts. And the third thing is, look, we should be doing more to prepare folks for the jobs of tomorrow. Uh, We should be doing more to prepare folks for jobs in renewable energy. We should be doing more to prepare folks for jobs in cybersecurity. You know, when I was in the federal government, there were thousands of job openings in the metro DC region in cybersecurity, public sector and private sector. And yet we have pretty small cybersecurity training programs in the state. We ought to grow those exponentially to try to meet that demand, give folks access to good jobs. I, I want to uh, jump in here and, and get a few. You, you said innovation economy. I, this is where I live. Literally, I'm listing my condo for the second time. Five years ago, couldn't sell it, couldn't get anybody to walk through it. Right after Freddie Gray, uh, before Kathy Pugh was making her mess here. Uh, obviously, the economy is different. We'll see. But I, 
I think Baltimore is getting better. I walk through it every day. I'm a believer. That's why I'm doing Baltimore positive, clearly. Mm -hmm. Uh, Every time Larry Hogan shows up for a photo op here, uh, you know, the obvious of what happened with the red line is there. But and we we talked to some of the pollsters and some of the people that feel the temperature. And I'm about to do this crab cake. I'm calling it crab cake diplomacy, you know, starting Mm -hmm. on the eastern shore moving through. Uh, th- this anti-Baltimore sentiment, you know, that it's okay to be from Harford County, wear an Oriole hat and hate Baltimore or hate on Baltimore or vote against Baltimore or feel like it's us against Baltimore. I certainly have felt that. I used to feel it with Yankees fans and Steelers fans, John. That, now I feel it more like oh, y- you live in Dundalk, you live in Parkville and you're telling me you're not coming to Baltimore. You live in Pasadena and you tell me you're never coming to Baltimore for a concert again or a, to the stadium for a ball game or when Billy Joel comes to town or whatever it would be. I, I, the, the feeling of how we merge that in the same way that all this Trumplandia has created that divide, Baltimore is the one here voting 92% against, uh, you know, <laughs> whatever that last thing was, but we're wondering, we wondered aloud with Michael Steele on the other side, who I openly admitted that I supported Ehrlich and Steele 20 years ago, publicly on the radio. I'm ashamed of it. And I told Michael that, but it's the Democrats that have put Ehrlich in charge. It's the Democrats who have put Larry Hogan in charge. And yet this sentiment against Baltimore is something that I think when this is all said and done is going to be at the heart of this on the other side. Hey, you don't like vote. You don't like Baltimore vote for me. And that's such a, uh, it doesn't even make any sense to me that the economic engine could be a political volleyball in the middle of this thing that you'll find yourself in the middle of over the next year. You're look, you're 100 percent right. I think what we have to do is is help folks in the rest of the state understand that all of our fates are bound up together. Uh, The state is going to be stronger. Our economy is going to be stronger if Baltimore City is stronger. Uh, And we need a governor who's going to sell Baltimore City nationally. I think the fact is Larry Hogan often criticizes Baltimore City rather than Baltimore. Exactly. You know, I feel that here. And then I see the mayor getting into it. And and that's not good. What's happened here this week's not not good for for my that's city, right. for our state. That's period, right. Right. That's right. That's well, right. Pick, we, pick up on that question, John. John, I, I love where Nestor's going with this. Pick up on that because there is this robust debate over what role Maryland should play in the city particularly in the crime area, because I think there is a general feeling. I think two things are happening in Baltimore City right now. Nestor's not alone, I think, in saying that over the past six months, as he walks around, and he walks Baltimore more than anyone I know, Baltimore feels and looks like it's getting better, with one big exception, violent crime. Mm -hmm. Homicides are up 17% this year alone. It's terrible it's heartbreaking. So what role do you as the governor play in helping get that indicator turned around in the city? Yeah, yeah. Well, look, several things. One, I think the governor has to be a partner with Brandon Scott in trying to tackle the issue of violent crime. And part of that is making sure that we go after legal trafficking of guns, that we that we are serious about taking on gun crime. But the problem is that's been the whole strategy. We haven't had the other two pieces. One, we need all the services that will try to get people's lives back on track. We need easy access to addiction treatment. We need better mental health services. We need an investment in violence prevention, violence interruption programs that go right to the folks who are involved in the shootings and try to help them uh, get their lives on track. And then third, we need an economic development strategy. I would argue crime is worse today in the city because Larry Hogan canceled the Red Line project. If people can't get good jobs, that is going to undermine any attempt to advance public safety. But as a country, we've had a strategy too reliant on policing and criminal justice alone as a response to crime. John, I can remember sitting in meeting after meeting with county executive cabinets as his chief of staff, as we saw presentations from those involved in the red line about the massive economic development that was going to take place around the stations. And 
when I look back on that in terms of a failed public decision with no input, with no analysis, then no one will repudiate that. No analysis, no input, other than simply to say it's going to make me look tough, goes back mm-hmm. to Nestor's point, tough on Baltimore. Mm-hmm. I'm going to cancel the red line, despite the fact that we had done all the hard work with Senator Mikulski, S- Senator Van Hollen, Senator Cardin, every, all, all the groundwork was laid, our congressional delegation to get these federal funds, but now are gone. I mean, it's, it really is a great example of failed public policy that needs to be discussed as we go forward, is it not? I think that's absolutely right. I also think the failure to have more uh, trains on the mark is, is, is a failure of public policy and a failure of vision. We should want people to be able to commute easily from living in Baltimore City if they want, if they want to work in D.C. We should be excited that folks want to do that. And that would add to the John, I housing market. On the mark. You talk yeah. about the housing market and the, the, it, it changes everything about the value of mm-hmm. everything here. And, yes. and it makes your tax dollar worth more yes. as a taxpayer. Yes. Yes. Well, well, N- Nestor, you knew when we got into this, I, w- I was going to love, I, w- I wasn't going to go without discussing the educational aspect well, of uh, I mean, our the, guest background. Well, I mean, Kerwin hasn't come up. How, did, how are we 20 minutes in? How did that <laughs> and, and we, we haven't talked Kerwin, and, but along with Kerwin, I would like you to put a face on a position that those of us who did spend a career in education think is very, very important. Not everyone does. And that is, You were the Secretary of Education under President Barack Obama. Following that, we had actually presidential candidates like Rick Perry and others say, ah, let's just do away with the Department of Education. I'm sure that's where Josh Hawley and and Ted Cruz Mm. are and Nikki Haley. Tell folks what you did as Secretary. In other words, Nestor likes the four dummy questions. What's a Secretary of Education do and why should people care about it? Yeah, yeah. So th- there are th- three main main things that the education department does. One is there's a uh, seventy billion dollar budget that gets resources to our highest need schools, resources to help students with disabilities, English learners, uh, resources to help low income students pursue higher education. Think about the Pell Grant program that's helped generations of students get access to college. So that that's one core function. A second function is civil rights protection. And that's really the history of the department uh, is as a civil rights agency, protecting students on college campuses from sexual assault, protecting uh, the rights of students with disabilities to get services, uh, protecting uh, students of color from disparities in discipline based on race, right? So So that civil rights enforcement role is critical. And then the third piece, and this is one that I think sometimes folks underestimate, Secretary of Education is really like the Surgeon General for education. They have this incredible bully pulpit. And what we had during the Trump administration and Betsy DeVos was someone who used that bully pulpit to attack public education, to undermine uh, public school educators. Uh, But now with Miguel Cardona, we have a secretary once again who's an educator like I like I am. And we have again a secretary who cares about and believes in the role that public education plays, not just in our economy, but in our democracy. So I'm very happy that he's there, I'm very happy that the Biden administration is there. But the but that role of Secretary of Education is really pivotal to our ability to win the 21st century as a country. I learned more about you after you were there because of the person that came after you to say, what is this job? I mean, I think a lot of people, and you know, and I don't have a kid in school right now, but I, I, we, we had Nancy Grasmick on and, you know, it's sort of been Mm. here forever. Um, and, and Don is my edge. He was literally, I met Don through education. We've sat with Ravens game. I'm a sports guy, John, you know what I mean? I've done sports here for 28 years. They told me to stick to sports and the education piece. Every time I'm with an educator, um, it, it, it does go back to the problems we have here and how to solve them, all of them, literally every one of them, guns, violence, all it, jobs, all of these things really began with my dad reading me flashcards when I was mm-hmm. three years old. 
and me and, and having a family that Don and I talk about this all the time. Someone around you who gets you into that pre-K, into that kindergarten where it all begins. And that that's the core of all of this. And that's where you stood beside President Barack Obama and trying to to make that better. And, and I guess as governor, that's got to be that that will stand in the center of what you're trying to do. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, this is part of why I've made the argument that there's real power and potential in having an educator as governor. It is a central function of our state government that undergirds everything else, whether you're talking about making sure that we have strong career and tech ed programs in high schools so, so students can get good jobs, whether you're talking about the role that community colleges play in helping working adults get better economic opportunities. Don't talk community college themselves. educated, by the way. I'm always proud of that. You yes, that. yes. Community colleges are, are one of our most important assets as a state, even on climate. You, do, you know that we have 480,000 school buses in the United States. One of the best things we could do to make progress on climate action would be to move all of our bus fleet over to electric buses. Schools. Well, you know, you don't hear people make those connections, that's uh, right. Mr. Secretary. That, I mean, that's a powerful. See, this is where, and I've been focused on what Carvel said. And if you get past the whole woke stuff, I think what he's saying is, Let's talk turkey to people. Let's mm -hmm. say things that make sense. And when you say to people, there's four, I wrote the number down, 480,000 school buses. Well, I don't have to be a, an astrophysicist to say, whoa, if we converted that fleet, the impact on our climate would be significant. And that's the kind of talk. Well, it's the we, education we and understanding what, <coughs> what climate change is. Yeah, and, we don't and get enough 75 of 75 million people who voted against that to understand that mm -hmm. they, their grandchildren, what are we teaching our children about this? And that's where where you come in, quite frankly. Yeah, yeah, no, schools, yeah. schools need to help prepare young people for a world that's already being affected by climate change. You know, we're already losing farmland on the Eastern shore to saltwater intrusion. You know, we have flooding in Howard County regularly that is connected to climate change. You know, you, you all certainly know how much pollution, air pollution we have in Baltimore City, right? Th this isn't a tomorrow problem. This is a today problem. And we could have schools working to address this, both in terms of what they teach, but also all the infrastructure, the buses, almost 100,000 school buildings, right? We have lots of opportunity to have education be a partner in our work on uh, climate action. And, and the reality, right, again, as someone who was county executive on the first weekend that he was in office, had the uh, Memorial Day storms of 2018 that flooded out totally large parts of southwest Baltimore County, parts of Howard County, the uh, Ellicott City for the second time. These 100 year storms are not 100 years apart anymore. Listen, before we let you run, I know, Nestor, we're going to hit you up with a crab quake question and hope you'll come back because we've just scratched the surface. But my political antenna went up a little bit, and I doubt that you you threw it out there without thinking. I can see you smiling. You say, well, we're going to have some celebrities in the race. I'm assuming that was a, a, a sort of a, a tip of the hat to uh, author Wes Moore and founder of the Fa Robin Hood Foundation. Is, 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 that, is that one of the things that discussions that you're going to look at as to whether or not Marilyn is in tune with that kind of candidacy? Because it seemed like a a, a sort of quick shot across the bow at Wes to me. Am I misreading that? Well, look, Wes is a friend. You know, what, what I'll say is that I believe it is important that the governor have uh, the experience and understanding of how government works to make sure that we not only talk about these ideas, but actually deliver. So I, it's not a slight to anyone else so much as to say, I, I'm in this because I've spent my whole life in public service and I want uh, to bring the experience I have in government to helping ensure that our state government in Maryland is a force for good in people's lives. Do you eat crab cakes? <laughs> I do. I do. I just, important, uh, important part of being, you know, you want me to go. I knew it was coming. Go ahead, Nestor. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, so part of my education, and, you know, Don was my high school guidance counselor and all this, and, um, and I told him three years ago I need to learn more stuff, and boy, have I learned a lot of stuff mm -hmm. back on January mm -hmm. 6th and beyond. So uh, this crab cake tour, I'm doing this crab cake diplomacy thing, so I'm going to see the whole state. I did 30 baseball ballparks in 30 days back in 2015 for the bone marrow registry. Nice. My wife's a two-time leukemia 
leukemia survivor and has a donor in Europe. Um, but I'm going to do Maryland because like we can't go anywhere. We've been wearing masks. Yeah, I'm not booking flights. There's plenty of places around here. I've never been to Antietam. I've never been to Rocky Gap. I've never been to Deep Creek Lake. I've never been to Chris Field. Uh, the political thing at Tall has never been to that. So Smith Island cake. I mean, Moeller's sending me Smith Island cake pictures. Like, yeah, yeah. So the crab cake thing is going to give me a chance to see people, meet people, maybe yeah. have a crab cake with way smarter people. So I ask people when someone's, when a celebrity does land, when Barack comes to, over for a crab cake, <laughs> where do you take the former president of the United States where I can play basketball and shoot some free throws at him? Where, where would you take him for a crab cake? Wow. Well, I'll tell you, I, this weekend, my family was in Annapolis. We had crab cakes at uh, Wild Country Seafood, you know, small spot, great crab cakes. Are you giving it a nine or a 10? I mean, is it a place you go back to? I, I, it's a place we go back to for sure. For okay. sure. Now, Takira Winfield Dixon, who I know Don knows on my team, she she says I have to get to Coco's Pub in, in, well, in Baltimore. So I've, I've not been there yet. There. You can't go there. We've already got bread. It's sort of like Hollywood <laughs> Squares. We got to pick the. So you have to have a, we'll go to Annapolis with you, but you know Brandon's already. So we were in Fadley's, which is our sponsor. Where we're starting, mm -hmm. and Brandon's like, I'm taking you to Coco's next. I'm like. Faith, this is our sponsor. What's wrong with me? Now I've decided we're going non. This is why I'm doing this because it's such a non. -din. Are you fried or broiled? Fried, fried. And now, uh, yeah. so you're getting closer yeah. to my vote. I, yeah. mean, I yeah. think West said yeah. fried or broiled at State. <laughs> where, where, John? Where do you get one at home? Where do you get one down in Silver Spring? When you're going to go out on a just on a quick for a neighborhood crab cake, where do you go grab one? In, and in if the you say in D.C., we're going to go statehood. And we're going to have all another segment. You know. <laughs> You know, the, the, I generally feel like you have to travel out, outside of the media area, although I, at Bus Boys and Poets, you, you can get crab cakes. Oh, but, but, uh, and a good know, book to read for you. And a good book to read. That's coming, right. That's right. Coming to, coming to Columbia, Maryland, thanks to our good friends at, at, at Howard Hughes. So, Mr. You know, Secretary. Looks like, by the way, it looks like Fraser behind you is at Bus, uh, Bus, Bus Boys and Poets. Look at it. Doesn't it look, he, look I, a little bit? He, he <laughs> might be. We're paying tribute. <laughs> This week, Mr. Secretary, to our good friend, Frazier Smith, who left us much too soon. And I, I want him looking over my shoulder. Uh, before we get out of here, tell folks where they can keep abreast of John King for governor campaign. Where can they go find more? And then in 30 seconds, tell them why they should think you're a serious candidate. Yeah. Uh, so folks can get more information and follow our campaign at johnkingforgovernor.com, johnkingforgovernor.com. And look, I think we have a lot of missed opportunities as a state, whether it's around uh, ensuring access to quality education in every part of the state, whether it's around economic development so that we have an, a, a thriving innovation economy that's creating great good jobs or taking on climate change and environmental justice issues. And I know from my experience as a pragmatic, progressive problem solver in government that I, that I can be the person to, to help lead us to a state government that delivers for people. Uh, and so I hope people will, again, come to johnkingforgovernor.com and follow our campaign. John, we had Nestor. a lot of uh, candidates and different people on, but you have like Roger's Theosaurus behind you. And as a writer, <laughs> I mean, like I was, you know, I old school, a old school. On my desk. Well, Mr. Watkins at Dundalk High, you remember Mr. Watkins, Don, right? Sure. Absolutely. He was John my pre SAT, uh, pre -SAT uh, SAT teacher, for SAT prep, and Mr. Stockett as well, right? So, I uh, mean, the Theosaurus, man, that was my friend. So I appreciate that. <laughs> so, Nestor, we had a little Harvard, a little Yale, a little Columbia former secretary of education, uh, important voice in the gubernatorial campaign in Maryland. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you hope this will be the first of many visits and hope you'll come back and update us throughout the campaign on how things are going. Absolutely. I look forward to it. Thanks for the opportunity to join you. Fried crab Thank cake you. in August. We're going to do it. All right. On the I'm there. All right. I'm there. There he goes, John King. I, you know, I only know him through television and stuff. We get the big guest around here working with the great Barack Obama. Love what, love your work. Thank you for your service you. in that way. Thank really you. appreciate that. Thanks so much. All right. And I, I told you, it took your, the, the person after to figure all that out. But thank you very, very much. Uh, so we have uh, all sorts of uh, gubernatorial candidates coming on. We're talking about all sorts of stuff around here, including the John Means no-hitter. It's Preakness week. Nothing more Maryland than that. And the Crab Cake Tour kicks off at Fadley's next week. We're really looking forward to talking crab cakes, eating crab cakes, and probably drinking a little beer along the way as well. I am Nestor. He is former Baltimore County Executive Don Moeller. We are BaltimorePositive.com.